All right, welcome to the home stretch, the last three talks of the afternoon session. Uh, our next speaker is David Coes from the University of Pittsburgh. We'll be talking about visualizing structure-based deep learning scoring functions for protein ligand interactions. And his fun fact is he ran the Pittsburgh Marathon this year and hopes to make drug discovery just as easy. I think running a marathon is not an easy thing to do, so <laughs> I mean, it's appropriate. Yeah, so who here has run a marathon? Good. Uh, yeah, who's run a marathon? Yeah. Uh, so when I, I, I was running it, the first mile, I'm like, God, this hurts. Why am I doing this? Uh, but by about mile 12 or 13, you know, the pain's overwhelmed your ability to think clearly. Uh, and so it's okay, and you just keep going. So I feel there's a lot of analogies to drug discovery. Um, but anyway, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is uh, in this paper, it's published. I have this habit of not talking about things that have been published and stop talking about them once they're published, but this is actually uh, published. Uh, Josh is actually was an undergrad. He's now at uh, UNC. Uh, but before I move into this area, I have a, something totally different to talk about, uh, which is novel insights or data visualization with active learning. So probably all of you have in your mind what I mean by active learning, right? It's uh, machine learning. and No, uh, it's actually something very different. Uh, it's pedagogical active learning. So who here is an educator? Seriously? OK, who here knows an educator? <laughs> All right, great. Uh, a chemical educator. Okay, well, that's you're stuck with it because the slides are here. Uh, but share this. Uh, what pedagogical active learning is is really about engaging the students. And where I uh, first learned about this, oh, right. So actually, the most important thing in any talk this whole week that's the password for the Omni Meeting Wi-Fi. All right, and it actually has okay bandwidth compared to the other one. Uh, and we're going to do a live demo, which is why I'm telling you this, uh, at the risk of crashing the Wi-Fi network. Uh, so go ahead and go to this URL. But uh, where he's first introduced to pedagogical, don't worry about URLs coming back, pedagogical active learning with this paper in science, uh, where they applied all of like, the most recent research in pedagogy, the study of teaching and learning, uh, to this uh, undergraduate, I think it was a physics, yeah, physics and physics course. Uh, and they had this massive shift from the gray bars to the black bars of uh, improvement in test scores, right? And then so they, uh, you know, flipped the classroom. Uh, they did all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, the thing that uh, registered with me were these uh, clickers. Uh, so who's seen these? Okay, good. So, uh, so the idea here is you is a, you don't have to flip your classrooms. You can give a normal lecture, but then you have a question. Instead of asking people to raise their hands and getting the same people in the front row answering it, uh, everyone has to answer this multiple choice question by clicking uh, this piece of hardware. Which you know, now this is pretty antiquated because everyone has a smartphone. You can you can just do it online. Uh, but this meta review here actually found that just doing this, you don't have to do all this other work, right? I have a hypothesis that the reason these active learning things work is the amount of effect, efficacy of teaching and learning is directly proportional to the amount of work put into it, right? So uh, the, these uh, flipped classrooms, all that's a lot more work for the professor. Uh, but here you say your lecture is normal, you put in these questions, and then uh, you find out in real time if the students are following along, if they're getting the right answers. And if not, then you can go back and re-explain, and if they, they perfectly understand, you don't have to keep talking about it. Uh, and I use this in my own classes. Uh, I have this little JavaScript widget that you're free to use uh, to embed in a Jupyter Notebook, uh, which if you don't know, you can turn Jupyter Notebooks into slides and give presentations from them. It's really great if you're doing a programming class. Uh, if you've ever tried to syntax color in PowerPoint, not fun. Um, and so you ask a question, and they click on it, and you can see what the answers are, and you can discuss it. Right? But what about if you're, you're teaching molecular structure? Right? Uh, there, it's not so much multiple choices, multiple atom, and you have molecules. And so we happen to have this uh, WebGL accelerated uh, 3D molded JS JavaScript library for 3D uh, visualization online. Um, and so uh, this summer, uh, uh, under the open chemistry umbrella, we had a Google Summer of Code student who's working on precisely uh, this, adding an active learning ability to 3D mold JS, right? 
So now this is where you all should have gotten your laptops out. If no one does this, this is going to be a really lousy demo, right? Laptops, you can get your phones out, that's fine. You don't need to be connected to the Wi-Fi. Phones, iPads, actually go to the URL. Um, it's audience participation time, no trophies, but I, I need at least one person to do this. Um, so 3dmol.csv.pit.edu slash viewer.html, all right? And so here I'm showing you some molecule and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a session. I'll call it ACS, capital ACS. Now, if you've got uh, 3dmol.csv.pit.edu slash viewer.html. Um, don't ignore the rest. You don't need the other stuff in there, right? Oh, good. Someone connected. Hi. Uh, so you can see users one connected, right? So they figured out. You go up here. You go ahead and type in ACS, all capitals, and click join. Um, maybe we could have more than one, two. That's fantastic. Uh, come on, I mean, this is an ACS talk. You all should have had your laptops out tweeting anyway. Um, four, five. Okay, so now this is a molecule, and I might want to show you something about this molecule. So I really hope anyone who actually has this open is now seeing the molecule move on their screen. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're holding something up. You think I'm 20 or something, and I can see that from back here. I don't know. No. Uh, I'll blame the Wi-Fi. Um, someone sees it, though. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, that's great. You called it a molecule. It's actually the uh, social network uh, icon. Right. Okay. I think I know what your background is. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, 3dmol.csb.pit.edu slash viewer. Uh, but we've got 10 now. So now I'm going to ask you a question. So one thing is if you can look someone who has it, I can control there. But once I let go, they can look at it themselves. But here's my question. Where are the chiral centers uh, of this molecule? All right. And so they should have now asked you to click on some atoms. Uh, and some of you are clicking on atoms. So who were the chemistry teachers again? All right, great. So do you know where the chiral, are, can you evaluate this? All right, all right, good. Because, you know, my background is computer science. Now, one of the biggest issues of using this, this clicker thing in a lecture is this problem right here. There's 15 of you connected, but four of you aren't clicking. All right, uh, which you have to have this patience as a lecturer to wait till everyone does it, because there's always the people like, I don't have to do that, I don't want to turn my brain on. But the whole point of this is to make everyone turn their brain on, uh, rather than just that front row of people. Um, but we also have a limited time here. Uh, so I'll just show the results. Really, hydrogen? Um, great, excellent. Right. So this would be something you'd probably want to address immediately in class. About, you know, I'm a computer science, I know hydrogen's not the right answer here. All right. Um, and you know what? I could explain to you if I, if I was a chemistry teacher uh, why some of these are right and some of these are wrong. And then I could ask you, uh, like in just in general terms, and I ask you to revise, which you can do. You can click again if you accidentally click that hydrogen. You can just click on it again. And I can uh, refresh these. Uh, okay, two hydrogen. Okay. <laughs> Someone's trolling. Uh, but I think majority votes winning here, right? Uh, and so now you actually have some insight into how your whole class is thinking. Right? So in the, in the previous talk, as mentioned, that neural networks are maybe the blackest box you could imagine. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little about how we cracked open that black box. But I, I actually think that undergraduates might be even blacker. Uh, so this is a chance, especially the ones who don't come to office hours or participate in class. This is a chance to open that black box. Uh, so I really, this is, you know, just developed this summary, haven't actually used it in a, a class yet, uh, but I'd really like to hear about your experiences, what you'd like to see uh, in terms of features, whether it works or not, um, and uh, let me know how it goes. Okay, so that was one aside. Uh, the main focus of our research is actually structure-based drug design. Uh, mostly because you generate really pretty pictures, which I think you can say in a visualization seminar, right? But also because uh, I believe this has the potential to create general models that you can 
actually apply to new targets where you have limited amount of uh, data. And our goal is to do virtual screening and lead optimization and predict poses and all this stuff. Uh, and as part of this, we have this funnel where you need to screen some chemical space. And we start by doing these very fast matching algorithms for shape and pharmacophores. Uh, who here has heard of Pharmit? All right, everyone else, uh, I'll be telling you more Wednesday morning. If you're interested at all in structure-based virtual screening, uh, you need to check this out. Uh, literally, you can screen zinc purchasable uh, subset in a few seconds. You get your hits. There are all the matches, exact matches for that pharmacophore. But then you're left with the question, well, well now I have 5,000, 10,000 molecules. Which ones are the best? And that's the next step, which is uh, the scoring, right? which also is important for docking and so on. And that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. I fully believe that ultimately you need dynamics and you need explicit water and uh, you know, simulation methods. But uh, for, in terms of high throughput, uh, we need to be able to score these uh, um, uh, protein ligand complexes. And to do that, we use a black box model. And we want to be able to predict the pose and whether it binds or not and what the affinity is. Uh, and we use neural networks because they're so flexible and have some other nice properties. A neural network is just a bunch of these neurons, which is a nonlinear function of its inputs, produce an output, and you put them all together in a network. That network has multiple layers. It's called deep learning. Uh, at some point, I hope to develop profound learning, but I don't know what that is uh, yet. But this is not profound. It's just multiple layers in a neural network. Uh, this is, and it's been enormously successful. This is Pittsburgh. This is my uh, office building on the third floor. This is a self-driving Uber. Uh, these are concrete barriers. Uh, so that's okay. um, but you know this has been very successful at all sorts of domains. Uh, and the way it works is you give the network an example. It makes some prediction. You see how bad it is, what the loss is. And then you back propagate that loss, which is just calculus saying, how does I blame for your failure to the different aspects of the network, the different weights? Right? That's back propagation. Uh, the specific kind of neural network uh, we use are convolutional networks, which are very uh, popular in images, where instead of uh, having a fully connected network where every pixel would be connected to a neuron, you just look at a small uh, kernel, uh, a little a local uh, region of that image, and learn a function that you then apply, convolve across the whole image. So you get this feature map. Uh, that maintains the spatial relationships. And we feel that spatial relations are probably pretty important for molecular re recognition, so that's why we use these. Uh, just to instantiate this a bit more, these are what happens when you apply these different kernels, 2D kernels across this image. These are edge detectors, identifying horizontal, vertical, or any edge in, a filter, in an image. So this is what you're doing. You're identifying this low-level feature, and then with additional levels of the network, you're putting those low-level features together to learn higher-level features, ultimately, hopefully, features like does it bind or not. Now, we don't have a 2D grid of red, green, blue values, uh, but instead, we extend that to a 3D grid with, uh, you know, this is a carbon, this is a nitrogen, this is oxygen, um, and that's our input. Now, there's other choices you can make in terms of training neural networks for a 3D structure-based drug design. Um, but there's some pretty clear co pros and cons to grid. So the biggest con is it's n not coordinate frame independent. Right? So if you rotate a molecule, as far as the neural network is concerned, you have a different input. Uh, there's actually a silver lining to that in the form of data augmentation, but it's a, a real concern. Uh, and you know, pairwise interactions, which is sort of the bread and butter of everything we, we do, are not explicit. But on the flip side, the spatial relations are very clear. If you give me one of these grids, I can easily write a short Python program to generate the exact structure you started with. Like the information's all there, and it's not hard to extract uh, from a computational standpoint. It's amazingly parallel. You put these on GPUs and they just fly. And there's what I'm going to talk about today. It's easier to interpret because you can go right back into the 3D space that we're used to looking at and thinking about. Uh, Another little aside is we have this, uh, we started doing um, all our stuff in cafe in our custom uh, building, blah, blah, blah. And we extracted all of our gridding code, molecular gridding code, into a standalone Python library that's still CUDA accelerated. So you can use it with cafe, which no one does because no one uses it. Uh, you can use it with PyTorch, which is awesome. Uh, you can use it with TensorFlow. You can, and you don't have to re-implement all this stuff uh, that we've done. Uh, so feel free to check that out. 
Uh, when we train, uh, I'm going to talk about two different training sets, a redoc training set, so from PDB bind, take the ligand out, put it back in, and uh, a crosstalk training set where we start with, with Pocketone, which has clustered the PDB based on pocket similarity, and so we uh, crosstalk, right, so which is more what you want to do prospectively, right, you're, you're never trying to predict a pose of an already known crystal structure, you have some version of the receptor and you're docking a lot of different ligands into it, right? So these are just two different data sets. Uh, we spent some time doing this auto ML uh, optimization, trying to find better uh, networks. This is $50,000 of Google Cloud credits, uh, and here's the network. Um, and here's uh, just a few results. There's gonna be a lot more results in a poster in the top section. Uh, but the point here uh, on the left is uh, pose selection. So what percent of the time do we actually get a, is our number one ranked pose uh, a low RMSD pose? And so, you know, we're close to 80%, a little bit better than uh, auto doc Vina. Just, this is just scoring. We're not actually doing docking, just scoring doc poses. Um, but when it comes to the cross docs that we do much better, um, which is reassuring. Uh, for affinity, we do all right. If you do the P9 core split, uh, we sort of get comparable, like theta is 1.8, we get that, that's 0.79. Uh, of course, you really don't want to, the P-bank horse set split isn't really a good measure. It's better to do this clustered cross-validation where you're testing on truly new tar novel targets um, because the whole point of structure-based drug design, in my opinion, is that you can generalize to new targets given the structure. And there we do worse. Uh, but there's still a correlation. All right. So... This is, those were the rear end of the horse. Maybe not super strong, but uh, good uh, empirical results. And then the theoretical explanation is, oh, we have all these spatial relationships and we're learning high order features like hydrogen bonding, that's a lower order feature, but hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic enclosures, things we haven't thought of, right? That's what we want the network to be doing. And when you actually visualize that, you get the front end of this horse. Right, which is what I'm going to show you. Right, so actually visualizing that, these are actually the weights in that first level. So it's like that uh, edge detector filter. Uh, not a whole lot you can get out of here, except it might uh, stand out to you that um, the metals and the halogens are white. Uh, this is just the receptor. It turns out for this, this training set, we had stripped all those away. Uh, so this made that clear. Um, what uh, you're actually seeing here is each row is a different filter and within each one of these columns uh, since it's a 3 by 3 by 3 convolutional kernel uh, you have 27 values and, and I just lay them out linear because I can't go in three dimensions on a slide uh, and so looking at this you can say oh there's strong activations across the filter but also um, like when you switch to the cross dock oh this one actually had uh, ions in it um, but there's also these striated forms, which I interpret as meaning, well, it's actually something orientationally uh, dependent, right? It's not all one value across it. But there's not a whole lot you can get from this uh, because you don't know what the next layers of the network are going to do. Uh, so we started probing this with toy systems. Uh, and so here we just have two atoms, one receptor atom, one ligand atom, because they're, they're labeled that way, and then see, well, what sort of potentials you get. And don't try to interpret this too much. The, the point was we actually do get a potential, which you know, maybe isn't very exciting to you, but it was exciting to us because we were concerned we'd just see total garbage come out. But there is this nice smooth potential. Uh, and they're also very different between the two training sets, very different. Right? So I, I, the, the training set is probably the most uh, important determinant of what happens to your model. Uh, just to zoom in, uh, let's see if I can see the good things in the back. So, if we have a uh, nitrogen donor on the receptor and a oxygen acceptor on the ligand, then you have this nice potential, and this is not an energy you want to want more positive is better. So you actually have a peak actually sort of at hydrogen bonding distance, you know, less than Van der Waals, more than covalent. Uh, that's very nice. Right? But some of these others, you have an acceptor going to nitrogen donor, it actually doesn't like it. Right? And, and some of these are just very weird, uh, I mean, here. Okay. So you can pick a few things that max your intuition, but some of them don't 
match anything, and some of them are the opposite of your intuition. Well, maybe this is just because it's a, a you know two atom set. It's too too much of a toy problem. So here's just a little bit more realistic. We have this little peptide, and and then still a single ligand atom, and seeing where it likes to put things. So this is where it likes to put carbon. Um, not too sure how to interpret that. These these make more sense. This is here. I want to put different acceptor acceptor types. So uh, this is basically what I expect. Uh, other than it seems to like to ignore that carboxyl group, but you know, it's you can notice it's definitely orientational. Like uh, you know, hydrogen bonds have an orientation, um, and when you start looking at donors, uh, it's treating the oxygen more like an acceptor than a donor. And then the nitrogen, this is perfect, right? The carbonyls, this is exactly where you want a donor, right? That's really reassuring. Except um, I'm lying here. Uh, this is actually I, I inverted the rendering. Instead of this being where it wants the nitrogen, it's the exact opposite. It's where it most doesn't want. It. Like it, it's just like with the the two atom. It is the opposite. It is the exact opposite of your physical intuition. Right? It's not just weird. It's shall we say wrong. Uh, and you know what's interesting about this is we train a different model, uh, like different. To uh, uh, network architecture on the same training set, you see the same behavior. But we see a different behavior with different training sets. Uh, just to continue to air our dirty laundry, if you zoom out on these, uh, this is another thing where you can see there's corner effects. So it's just like if you have a Roomba in a square room, it's not going to get the corners as much. When we're training, uh, we, you normally doesn't see anything in the corners. And so we have this corner effect, and this is pretty easy to deal with just by making sure your ligand never goes in a corner, actually, or you could just have a spherical grid. Um, and so that all helps guide our thinking about, OK, what might be wrong? Uh, how should we change the training? Uh, but one of the things we want to bring in is, can we actually guide medicinal chemistry? And for that, we want to map back onto the molecule itself. And so we have three approaches for that. The first one masking was actually discussed in the previous uh, talk. It's uh, um, but then we can look at the gradients and flare-wise uh, relevance. So masking is just take your system and remove atoms and compute the difference and then just uh, uh, color by the difference. So it's saying, what's the sensitivity of the model to changes to the input? And what was neat, so Josh, uh, who was working on this, was taking maximum molecular structure and function at the time. And he had this idea, well, let's just uh, look at um, enzyme mutants. So, these are places where people have done the mutation and they know whether residue is important or not. And this is pretty anecdotal, but it worked out quite well that the residues that the network model highlighted as being important were actually the ones that were known experimentally to be important. And some of these aren't even actually particularly close to the active site, or they at least aren't contacting the ligand. And so that was nice. Uh, the other thing we looked at was um, we found partially aligned poses. So these are dot poses that were half right. There's like part of the molecule is perfectly aligned with the crystal structure, which is magenta here, and then there's some torsion and it goes off in a different direction. And you can see like it's redder where it's wrong and greener where it's right. And if you move the red part back to the right place, it turns more green. Um, so that was reassuring. And this is with masking. Uh, gradients it exploits this property of the neural networks is that they're differentiable. And you remember during training, you, this is what you do is you update the weights. But if you already have a trained network, uh, you can just keep the weights they are and just keep going and update the input. And you can say, this is how much uh, it wants there to be more oxygen here or less oxygen here. Right? And so we can, uh, this actually, I, don't, I love this picture, right? it, it makes perfect sense here. Uh, it matches with the expected electrostatic potential. Uh, but this isn't particularly uh, physical, but you can uh, backpropagate one more time onto the atoms themselves, and then you get a vector quantity, um, which you can uh, use as a force to actually optimize these molecules with respect to the convolutional neural network potential. Uh, and you can also uh, use, visualize it. Uh, we're currently uh, exploring this idea of having non-physical molecules. They're, I mean, they're not molecules, it's non-physical grids. What happens when you just optimize the grid itself? And can we use this for virtual screening or some up, something else? Uh, so it's creating something very, um, in some sense, it's a generative model, but it's very non-physical. Uh, 
In the final method, which is the one I had the highest hopes for, because mathematically it's the most uh, appealing to me, uh, is relevance propagation, where you have some score like 0.98, that's the end of the network, and this just says, okay, let's look at the weights of the network, here's how I'm dividing that 0.98, and the, that top equation is just saying that each level of that network, when you sum the relevances down, it's all going to add up to 0.98, uh, and it's been proportioned among the different nodes according to the weights, and so when you get back to the very beginning, you can say this is how much uh, this atom contributed to that 0.98. Uh, and what's nice about this, and unlike the other ones, is it actually can tell you where having nothing at all actually affected the score, right? So empty space would be, in some sense, the implicit solvent. So in this case, it's actually saying it did not like that there wasn't something continuing to extend from the pocket but it's happy there wasn't something farther out into the solvent. And you can actually see that. Um, now, when you look at all these, they are surprisingly incongruent. They all show different things. They are asking different questions, uh, but they're, they're, uh, it's, uh, I, I can't tell you I know exactly how to interpret all these. Uh, in general, it seems that the masking is the one that makes the most intuitive sense to how we expect things to work. Uh, and we have yet to really see LRP doing something that made sense to us, um, even though it seems the one that would be the most directly relevant. Uh, okay, I think I have plenty of time, right? Four minutes? Oh, I did. Well, here's another aside. We'll do it anyway. Um, so this was uh, an interesting uh, experiment by an undergraduate. Again, toy models to visualize and understand what's going on. Two atoms. Can a neural network, convolutional network, tell me what the distance between them is? Now, obviously, CNN is not the right way to compute the distance between two atoms, but that's not the point, right? So the red is the training set, and the blue, which is not there yet, is the test set is the rest of the graph. So who here thinks it will be able to correctly extrapolate, right? Who here thinks it will be able to correctly interpolate? Two people, optimistic. <laughs> All right, who here thinks they'll be able to extrapolate? No, I, I use the words interpolate, extrapolate. Um, so in this case, actually, it's right. It can interpolate. Uh, I mean, this is crazy, right? It's in the opposite direction. Right. Uh, same thing with area. So here's the, who thinks they'll see the same thing here? One person. One person's brave enough, like, yeah, you wouldn't ask this question unless it was different. Right. Who thinks they'll be able to extrapolate? Yeah, no one. So it kind of can. Right. And so my thought on why this is is because what do you need to compute area? You need distances. Right. And even if you have a small or large area, like that's unrelated to the distance size. So and in fact, uh, embedded in this network is distance information. Uh, so this is my conclusion slide, uh, which is to remind me to say that the point of this exercise in terms of a, sort of a general approach is uh, you need to test your assumptions of why something's working. And I think with neural networks, especially in ML in general, uh, you're probably going to be disappointed. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge everyone who did all the different work and would be happy to take any questions. And if you want to know more about how, how these networks are actually working, how well what the results are, check out the posters. Thank you. Uh, for the PDB bind, right, so for the crosstalk, it's millions of posters. Uh, but uh, we do data augmented. It's very hard to keep honest. But uh, and you're right, like, everything's automated, so there's always a risk that there's some overlap. I don't remember off the top of my head, but more than one thing to say. Um, yeah, the convolutional network actually has fewer because of the weight sharing. One more last question. Well, we can make one. Go. Have you used scratching dividers here on the delivery date for the current method for this technique? No. Thank <laughs> you.